Bunker don't play games. Except now. When I'm playing this game. Greetings friends, Ogre here. After recovering from a gaming related assault by something, I had this inclination to talk about Out of the Abyss by Wizards of the Coast. So Out of the Abyss came out in 2015 in September, only a few months after Princess of the Apocalypse came out. Didn't give us a lot of time to finish Princess of the Apocalypse before moving on to this. So Out of the Abyss starts out with you being captured. You've been captured by the drow, taken to the Underdark, and you're going to be sold as slaves in Menzo Branson. Menzo Branson. As you're escaping, the slave outpost gets attacked by demons, and so it becomes a kind of a race against time where you were trying to escape the Underdark, escape demons, and also escape your drow pursuers. It's an exploratory adventure through the Underdark with a lot of cast of NPC characters, a lot of unique locations, and a lot of old-time favorites like a visit to Gauntlegrim. So what is Out of the Abyss? Well, I would classify Out of the Abyss as a linear sandbox. And now I know what you're thinking. How can a sandbox be linear? Just wait. I feel that way because it leads you in a very specific direction. It's not a railroad, but I feel at times it really wants to be. There are tools in it that allow you to add random events, but it really, it hides that fact under all these mechanics and it does it really well. It's very tricky. So who wrote it? So this is written by Wizards of the Coast in a collaboration with Green Ronin Publishing. Now Green Ronin Publishing is mostly known for the Fantasy Age system, which is what the Dragon Age RPG is based off of. It's a system that uses stunt dice, it's another D20 fantasy system. It was the first book they put out that listed as a collaboration with another company. Now you're gonna notice this collaboration come up a lot more in the future books. It marks a change in tone and organization in the books going forward. Now, is it for the better? Yes. Is it perfect? Hell no. But we'll talk about that. So I know what you're thinking, Ogre, how are you gonna shit all over this one? Well, actually, I really like this adventure. I like it a lot more than the first two. I like that it emphasizes exploration and survival, which are also themes in some of my favorite OSR games. And I love those games. I love those games. It also kind of holds a special place in my heart because it was the, really the first published module that my group really connected with. That They really liked it and I enjoyed running it. So I kind of see it through these rose-colored glasses. And I'm going to be very honest about that. I do see it through this, this lens. As kind of a guy who really likes literature, I found the allusions to Alice in Wonderland awesome. I love that part of it. The group of NPCs you start with, like it's a large group. I think it's like eight, eight people. And I really like them. I like that they're all different and how they tied into locations you would visit later on, depending on if you let them go or not. And sometimes they would travel with you. It all depended on your group's choices. But when I played it with players, they all had their favorites. And with the twists and turns in it, they all were either pleased or disappointed by what happened. So even though I do see it with rose colored glasses, I do still have my criticisms of it. Because I think it's worth criticizing. So one of my big criticisms about it is there is a lot of material in it that you have to go over as a DM before you can run a session. This isn't a book you can simply pick up and run chapter by chapter. I did try that at first and it failed miserably. Even though it has all the aspects of a good sandbox, 
it's not organized or referenced in a way that makes using those tools easy or easily accessible during play. There are no reference sections, there are no page numbers, and it's not indexed. You have to track the, the drow chasing you, the, the madness effect, the NPC's motivations, all what they're doing. There's a ton of stuff you need to keep track of, and it's just a lot to do without a lot of prep. You know, maybe you're watching this going, well, I ran it without a lot of prep. Well, I'm an experienced DM and I struggled with it. I had a hard time with it and I'm sure I'm not alone. There's a lot of moving parts. In fact, so many moving parts. Um, I don't think it's for a beginner DM. I don't think a beginner DM would be able to handle this and do the module justice the way that I think it was intended. I feel that there's so much in this module that it could really overwhelm a new dungeon master and the book simply doesn't prepare you for that. Also, there's no level suggestions for the sections. So you can do a random encounter and at the beginning have it be very difficult, but as you get into it, they just become tedious. So it forces you to have to, once again about that planning thing, it forces you to have to plan ahead and adjust the encounters accordingly. Like how do you make, how do you make a group of goblins or a group of worms fun for a level 9 party? It, it's not something you can do instantaneously unless you're very very experienced. I feel that it falls apart halfway through. My group got out of the Underdark and then they didn't want to go back but the story kind of pushed them towards that. They were really tempted to say no to Brunor Battlehammer in Gondolgrim and I think that's a failing of the adventure. I don't think you should really leave until the adventure is over. Have that be your reward. Why would you go back? Why would you go back? You were slaves. Why would you go back? The second half of it does have a lot of really good ideas, um, such as the labyrinth, the worm hole, the worm tunnel labyrinth, and this group of kind of like under dark rebels. These like this, the, the Society of Brilliance, which I thought was, I thought was really good. Um, but there's a ton of these ideas and they don't all flow together really well. Now, you're going to hear me say this a lot in future videos. There's a ton of ideas that don't flow together really well. And I'm going to be talking about that a lot. That's going to be a theme you're going to see come up with upcoming videos when I talk about these other modules. The demons Graz and Orcus are mentioned as stat blocks, but they're never mentioned in the adventure itself. I don't know why their stats are in the book. It, the, the, you don't use them at all. I mean, maybe it's a tool that, hey, if you want to use them, you can, but well, why, why? I really like the survival part, but there was a ton of mechanical advantages that certain classes had that made a lot of those survival, like really like tense survival moments, completely moot. I'm talking about Goodberry. Goodberry completely fucked the tension I had could build up for survival. Oh, we're gonna starve. We're gonna eat dirt and twigs. That's okay, guys. I got Goodberry. Like, there's no struggles to find food or water because you have Goodberry. I'm starting to think I just really hate Goodberry. So what are the themes in this module? Well, it covers underground exploration. It covers bizarre monsters and environments, alien environments, and survival. So what are some independent or OSR modules that I think do that better? The first one I want to talk about is Operation Unfathomable! exclamation mark by the Hydra Cooperative. I only have a PDF of this, so let's, sh here it is. Operation Unfathomable is kind of told in this pulp kind of style, as you can see by some of the pictures and things here. Um, it's uh, more as a adventure primer than a, than a story module. Um, it outlines a lot of locations and a lot of events and things, and it really does it in a very, pul in a very pulpy, way. It doesn't take itself very seriously. It's a lot of fun. To me, Operation Unfathomable kind of reminds me of Fever Swamp, where it's like you're given just this location to play around with. It To me, it is a true sandbox. So in a completely different vein, there's also Journey to the Center of Earth for Dungeon Crawl Classics, a level four adventure by Harley Stroh. Journey to the Center of Earth is a module and also comes with two supplementary modules that cover a lost city in Earth called uh, Baraco or Baraco, Baraco? I'm gonna say Baraco. And also Layers of Las Agartha, which is this uh, other underworld of the city. The mantra self-details um, 
kind of Aerith, which is like this continent inside of the world. So think of those classic adventure stories where they dig to the middle of the earth and they find dinosaurs and trees and, and an entire ecosystem. It's kind of like that, except without the trees. It's basically this lost civilization that's, that's in, the, in the Underdark. It's a world beneath our own. And it's got its own sun, it's got its own oceans, it's, it's basically an entire underground continent. The module details like its geography, the legends surrounding it, um, a lot, there's a lot of information about the city, about, about the culture in here as well. And I found it really interesting. It kind of approaches the Underdark, not as kind of a, um, like a dark, terrible place, but more like a Jules Verne style adventure setting. So it's Gonzo, it's weird, it's Dungeon Call Classics Underdark setting. It's very hyperborean, there's a lot of weird gods, it's, it's a lot of crazy treasure, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a hoot, honestly. Now in a completely different vein, there's also Veins of the Earth by Lamentations of the Flame Princess, written by Patrick Stewart with art by Scrap Princess. This is a very thick book, and it is extraordinarily detailed. It is a very realistic cave spelunking toolkit. There are rules for, like, a lot of encumbrance and darkness that are very simulationist. It talks about mapping in 3D space. There's not just left, right. There's up, down, sideways. There's rivers that you have to follow. There are very detailed rules about madness in here, but related to darkness mostly, because you spend most of your time in silence and the dark because you're crawling through a cave. In fact, in the Underdark, light is actually currency called looms. You actually can use it to trade in the with the other cultures that live down here it is a, it is a resource that is meant to be spent there's almost detailed simulationist rules for encumbrance exploration climbing and travel the, there's huge sections about how to generate random cave systems it's not just it's it's a setting toolkit for doing adventures in deep dark caves where light has hasn't ever seen the, the creatures and, and species down here are extraordinarily alien they have their own languages, they have their own cultures. They even, there's even a, a magic related to rope because rope is so valuable and, and important down here. There's not a lot of money. There's an entire culture that trades strictly in favors. Just like in Out of the Abyss, they have their own like dark elves and they have their own gray dwarves. However, their dark elves are very dark. In the Dungeons and Dragons setting, dark elves are kind of a, um, like an exiled race of elves. In Veins of the Earth, their Dark Elves are literally formed from nightmares and dreams, and they long to uncreate reality. They are made from memories of pain, and in those memories hold strange magics which they use to, to un undo things that they hate, and they hate you. It describes them as not quite real and not quite dream, but they are beautiful, the color of the darkness, and they never age. They long to tear down the walls between sleep and dream, because that is where they have their most power. And they live forever, so one day they hope to achieve that. They will live to see it. So I want to take you aside and really talk about Veins of the Earth. Veins in the Earth is the book that inspired me to make this video series. I had read Out of the Abyss and I had a great time running it and a great time playing it. And then Veins of the Earth came out and I read it and all I could think of was, wow, this book kicks the shit out of every single theme and concept in Out of the Abyss. and just takes it up to 11 and does it far better. Veins of the Earth is what, ins is what made me want to talk about all the other books that do it better. So, thank you, Veins of the Earth. Very inspiring to me and very personal. So if you are an experienced DM, I actually recommend Out of the Abyss. I, I think it's fantastic. I think it's probably my favorite one that they've released at all. Um, but if you really want a more in-depth experience, I can't recommend Veins of the Earth enough. If you want a little more kind of gonzo experience, a little, a little more wacky, then Journey to the Center of the Earth is, is excellent. And if you want that more pulpy feel, then Breakout Operation Unfathomable. They're all easily converted to DD5E with just a little elbow grease. 
So that's all for this video. If you liked what you saw, you can go to my website, overplaysgames.com, and also subscribe and hit that little bell. I don't upload very regularly, so if you hit that bell, it'll always send you a notification as to when you, a new video from me is upon you. And as always, I'm on the Facebooks and the Twitters. Anyway, I think the missus got dinner ready. I heard a bee buzzing around here, and I don't know about you, but I love me some sweet fried bee. Anyway, keep playing games.